Hello and welcome to The Sidebar, presented by True Crime Daily, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at JoshuaRitter.com. We are recording this on Friday, March 1st, 2024. In this week's episode... What effect will new federal evidence have on the trial of a woman charged with killing her police officer boyfriend? Plus, trial continues in the case of a film armorer and prop master charged for the onset death of Alec Baldwin's film Rust. But first, we have breaking news. Guilty on all counts is the verdict for a woman accused of conspiring to murder and conceal the body of a wealthy socialite. Today, we are joined by Joel Waldman, a Emmy-winning journalist, investigative reporter, and host of the YouTube show Surviving the Survivor. And today, Joel has some exciting news for us. Joel, welcome. Josh, great to be here. Appreciate you having me back. I'm glad that happened. Absolutely. I've been looking for this, especially because you have something new to talk to us about. You have a new book out. It's aptly entitled Surviving the Survivor, but the subtitle, which I love, is a brutally honest conversation about life and death with my mom, a Holocaust survivor. Joel, I've read some advanced portions and it is funny and it's touching and it's moving and it's inspiring and I really enjoyed it and I'm very glad that you went through the effort to put it together with you and your mom. But tell us more a little bit, if you could, about the book and how it came to be. Well, Josh, I appreciate that. It is called Surviving the Survivor. It is uh, just like the podcast uh, title. Um, People always ask, you know, because we host a true crime uh, show and my mother does co-host periodically, making her, I declare, the oldest podcaster uh, in the country. (laughs) Um, But during the pandemic, you know, everything screeched to a halt. I had been a uh, broadcast news journalist, uh, most recently covering politics with Fox News nationally. And the, I had left that because I have three small kids. And uh, fast forward to uh, I started my own business and then the pandemic hits, everything shut down. So I just had this idea, you know, my mother's a very unique person for many reasons. She's a Holocaust survivor. She's also a licensed marriage therapist. Um, I talk about this in the book. She lost a, a child and through, through the course of writing this book, sadly, she lost her husband and my father of 63 years. So. Um, I pitched to her a podcast, but more importantly for me was telling her story. Um, she is a, a real force of nature, a tour de force, as they say. And uh, it kind of weighed on me for all these years. Number one, because I didn't know the story very well. Number two, because I had never done anything about it. A long, long time ago, back in the late 90s, I actually worked for a short period of time just for the summer for Michael Moore and he, the documentary filmmaker, and he encouraged me. And back then I went to Israel and Europe and interviewed a whole bunch of people and that stuff just sat there. But finally, um, I don't know what it was that propelled me to actually sit down and write this book. I'm literally coming from uh, the audio recording studio. It is currently available on Amazon as a pre-order and will be available on Audible, but it is my mother's Holocaust story but it's also about life and death. It's also, um, you know, ju- just about her travel, basically a travelogue through life, following someone. Uh, she grew up with horse and buggy and is almost 85 years old in a state-of-the-art recording studio with me, uh, putting this down vocally so people can listen to it. So it is, uh, it's been quite the challenge, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, that's quite a journey, uh, too, to, that she's gone through in life. And I, I will say what one of the things I really enjoyed was, I mean, it is an incredibly uh, serious and sad subject of what she's gone through in her life and the loss, like you said, that she's experienced. But there are laugh out loud moments in it. I mean, just the kind of interplay between you and your mother and the, <laughs> the part that uh, I, I would always enjoy is you include these little, this is an actual voicemail I received from my mom, little uh, seg- segments put in there. It's it's So any book that I think can make you feel that range of emotions is well worth checking out. So I, I'm, like I said, I'm very glad you did it. I knew, I know it must've been a lot of work, but I think um, everyone listening can do themselves a favor and pick up a coffee copy because it's, it's well worth uh, the effort. So thank you again for coming on to talk about that. 
Uh, but let's talk about some of these cases that I know that you follow closely as well. Uh, we'll jump right in out of Stamford, Connecticut. Jurors have reached a verdict for a woman charged with conspiracy in the murder of a wealthy socialite. The morning we're recording this, Michelle Traconis was convicted on all counts for her part in the disappearance and murder of Jennifer Dulos, the ex-wife of Traconis's boyfriend, Fort Photos Dulos. Prosecutors contend that Photos Dulos carried out the murder with Traconis, aiding in the cover-up of the crime. Complicating the prosecution was the absence of Jennifer Dulos's body and the absence of the alleged killer because Photos Dulos, who committed committed suicide, pardon me, shortly after he was charged. Before rendering their verdict, jurors entered the courtroom earlier last week to ask for clarification about the charge of tampering with evidence as an accessory. Specifically, jurors wanted to know if Traconis had to have physically contact with the items that were thrown away in the crime to find her guilty on that charge. Under state law, the charge does not require Traconis to touch the items, which may have been the one hangup that they had, knowing that we have a verdict today, which proved problematic for the woman who was seen on surveillance in the passenger seat of a vehicle of her boyfriend disposed of trash cans at multiple locations, but it wasn't clear if she ever touched the bags. Jurors ultimately convicted Traconis on the tampering accessory charge, along with charges for hindering the prosecution and conspiracy to murder Jennifer Dulos. Traconis, age 49, is set to be sentenced on May 31st. She faces up to 20 years in prison or possibly more from what I'm reading in, in reports if the judge decides to run her sentence concurrently. In the meantime, her bond has been set at $6 million. Meanwhile, the family of Jennifer Dulos is hopeful that the conviction brings forward new interests and information leading to the whereabouts of the victim's body. Joel, first of all, I know this is one of those cases that you have covered on your podcast. Um, what was your reaction? Um, so we've been covering this, and I just want to add that uh, Surviving the Survivor has two channels now, one with the best guests in true crime, and of course you uh, challenge us in that regard, except for maybe when I'm on. And we have another <laughs> channel called uh, Best Trials in True Crime. So this was the first case that we covered gavel to gavel. And this began uh, back on January 11th, seven weeks, a ton of evidence. Uh, what was really fascinating from the onset, and I'll, I'll tell you my reaction to the verdict in a moment, is we were all anticipating opening statements. It turns out in Connecticut, there are no opening statements. It was so weird. So these jurors got thrown right into, you know, basically midstream into this story. And there are only six regular jurors, unlike a 12 panel, typical uh, jury panel. Uh, so those were two sort of outliers. So fast forwarding to today, I've had myriad guests on to discuss this and almost across the board, uh, every criminal defense attorney, every investigator I talked to said, hey, the state's got a really big uphill battle with the first count, the conspiracy, the first charge conspiracy to commit murder. They thought she would get, you know, charged with some of the uh, lesser counts, um, they're convicted on some of the lesser counts, but not to be. She was convicted on all of the counts, including the conspiracy to commit murder. And Josh, I don't need to tell you, you're a seasoned prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney. That is the most serious charge. And as you said, she's now looking at somewhere between 20 to 30 years uh, behind bars in a state prison in Connecticut. So I think so many people were really flabbergasted uh, by this verdict today. Yeah, and I'm I'm one of them. I I I I was one of the ones who said beforehand that I thought, uh, yeah, there might be some evidence to say that she knew or should have known what was going on afterwards. But the but to say that just based on her relationship with him, she should have known that he was going to go kill her is it just seemed like a bridge too far to me. So I am surprised by this now. You know, those jurors, I, I did not follow this gavel to gavel. So they're they're getting more evidence that may be coming out in the reporting and some of the summaries that we see afterwards uh, of court. But it is, to me, a real stretch. And I will say one thing I'm curious about that bothered me from a lawyer's perspective was this idea that the, the prosecution used this. I think they referred to it as a... Uh, like a like a diary or a, a the, like a day of uh, log of where they had been, and they use that to say, you know, no one no one puts together their whereabouts unless there's some sort of problem with that. But my understanding was they had been instructed to do that by an attorney, and that raises a bunch of kind of attorney client 
privilege issues and everything else. How do you think that played out and will that cause problems down the road in a possible appeal? Well, uh, you know, they always say, obviously, the truth is stranger than fiction. And what you just said is absolutely correct. I think one of the reasons uh, we saw this conviction on all counts today uh, in, in the reading of this verdict is exactly that. There was a uh, sort of an alibi um, uh, yeah. presentation from the state. They basically right. said that Michelle Traconis was by um, Fotostulos' side and was even answering his phone. But to your point about attorney-client privilege, um, look, it passed muster. This judge, Kevin Randolph, he had a very strong command of the control room, uh, of the uh, courtroom, sorry, um, I've been doing TV too long, but he had a very <laughs> strong command of the, uh, the courtroom. And um, obviously it was something that was admitted uh, into evidence and something that the jury looked at very strongly and I think played a big part in her conviction. Yeah, that may have been a very pivotal piece of evidence. And I guess that's why it bothers me even more so. That's right. That's what they call it was the alibi diary. Uh, yeah, it was, because... it, was, it was kind of a point by point yeah. alibi that the state said, hey, look, uh, this was fabricated. Now, the other thing is we have to keep in mind, no body was ever discovered here. Uh, Jennifer Farber's body is still uh, the whereabouts is un are unknown. Uh, she had five children. And uh, those kids were in the courtroom for closing arguments. Uh, but some of the evidence uh, admitted were bloody, uh, as a bloody shirt and a bloody bra. And uh, you could see when that was uh, shown in court, it really um, captured the courtroom's attention and presumably the jurors who obviously we couldn't see. But I think seeing blood, which by the way, uh, those were put into bags, the bra and shirt, and then Michelle Traconis' fingerprint was discovered on those plastic bags. That certainly didn't help her case either. No. But the connection between Fotis and Michelle knowing and actually conspiring, people thought there was that little bit of a gap. The jurors didn't. So yeah. uh, that's no, how you're that. absolutely right. If this was the trial of, of Fotis for the murder, I don't think I'd be shocked by the, the results of this because I think there is a lot of evidence that connects him to 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 the murder and the disappearance of her body and 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 less troubling uh, about the whereabouts of her body. If we know that he somehow disposed of it and cut it up and, you know, uh, dumped the bags in different areas around town. But again, like you said, not to just keep on going back to the same point. How do you say that she knew he was going to go do that? And that's. That to me was the part that I thought was maybe too difficult for the prosecution, but obviously the jurors felt differently and it's only their opinion that really matters in this case. You know, Fotis Dulos, uh, to use the phrase, unalived himself. He was out on bond uh, awaiting his trial and, you know, that was the end of Fotis. So I think that there was a certain bloodlust here um, by the public at, you know, writ large because they yeah. couldn't convict Fotis. Maybe they were a little tougher on Michelle Traconis. You might be right. You might be right. They might. There might be the sentiment that somebody needs to be held responsible for their murder, and and she has. So, uh, like I said, one of those very fascinating cases with a very sad set of circumstances. Because now you've got kids with without both of their parents. Let's move to uh, Norfolk County, Massachusetts, where the trial of a woman accused of killing her police officer boyfriend has been delayed for at least a month after the release of a mountain of federal documents. Karen Reed faces a second degree murder charge for the death of Boston police officer John O'Keefe after prosecutors alleged she ran over her boyfriend outside of the house of another officer before leaving him to die in the snow. The case has drawn attention and division with some believing that Reed is the victim of a massive cover-up. Reed's trial, which was slated to begin on the 12th of this month, will be pushed back for around five weeks in order to give her defense time to sort through more than 3,000 federal documents concerning a probe of Reed's arrest and prosecution. In addition to the delay motion, Reed's attorneys say they intend to make another filing alleging governmental misconduct based on evidence from the probe. Meanwhile, prosecutors maintain that the evidence contained in the federal filings is consistent with the case, claiming that 90 to 95 percent of the materials received is consistent with the Commonwealth's theory of the case. That's a quote. And revealing that DNA evidence from O'Keefe was allegedly found on the bumper of Reed's car and that testing found tiny pieces of taillight in his clothing consistent with broken pre pieces from Reed's taillight. <coughs> Reed's taillight, pardon me. 
With trial now slated to begin April 16th, we keep an eye on this case as it continues to develop. Joel, first off, 3,000 new documents on the eve of trial. I, regardless what this contains, this is not a good look for the prosecution. And this bothers me, having been a prosecutor. It, it You know, turn it over. Turn over the stuff. Regardless if you feel like you're going to use it, regardless if you feel like it's important, avoid all of these problems and avoid any appearance of there being, uh, you know, shady dealings. And just hand it all over. But you turn over 3,000 new documents on the eve of trial. And of course, it's going to cause problems. What are your reactions? Yeah, I mean, this case is wild. And I've covered it uh, in, you know, in bits and pieces. But, um, you know, the phrase circus befits this <laughs> trial up in Boston for many reasons. I went to school up in Boston. I absolutely love uh, the, the city. It is very passionate. And people are... Um, you know, they, they've got uh, emotions and feelings. And in this particular trial, it is very divided, uh, almost like the partisan politics in our country. Half the people believe that um, Karen Reed is 100 percent guilty, that she killed John O'Keefe, the Boston police officer who was her friend. The other half firmly believe that this is, as you said, a conspiracy theory. And so there's been this kind of budding of heads, not just inside the courtroom between the state and the defense, but but outside the courtroom. There's a blogger well known I've had on my show, Turtle Boy, and I can discuss him more in a moment. But he is uh, he's kind of lit the fire to some of this division, and it turns out he was having conversations with Karen Reed. But just to circle back to your original question, I'm horrible at answering things directly. <laughs> So maybe I'd be a good lawyer or politician, but 3,000 pages, it's insane. I mean, apparently this is coming from the Massachusetts Attorney General's office. It's literally 3,074 pages. And uh, the state admitted, look, it is voluminous, but the defense says this is all brand new, Your Honor, and it appears to be exculpatory. It does seem kind of crazy, Josh. Yeah. It's it's an unforced error is the problem that bothers me for the prosecution. Now, regardless if you say it really reveals nothing new or not, the judge has to give them the opportunity to go through all that because they need to make a determination if it's uh, valuable to them, exculpatory or not. I mean, they may view this evidence a different way, but it's like, why hand the defense this easy opportunity to throw more mud on the prosecution's case. And I and I want to get to the point that you were making earlier because a lot of this, I, I feel like the defense has done a remarkable job of one thing, and that is calling into the question, the prosecution, there's a high level of public distrust surrounding this. But my question is, one, tell us a little bit about that. But two, is this all a bunch of noise that really won't have an actual impact on the trial? Because the jury probably won't know about all of this. Uh, that's a great point. You know, hopefully they pick the right jury that is, you know, supposed to be impartial. And I've had so many guests on uh, lately, Josh, who are attorneys like yourself, who say that there's been a shift from a presumption of innocence in this country to a presumption of guilt. Maybe I'll get you on my show to talk about that one day. Uh, but there is strong evidence to suggest uh, that Karen Reed um, did in fact commit this crime basically by backing over her boyfriend. But then, yeah. like I said, you've got the other half who says, look, uh, the law enforcement agencies in Massachusetts are corrupt. That's the contention, especially in Canton, um, wh where this is uh, all playing out. And uh, they believe that what really happened was that John O'Keefe was beaten up in this house a dog even bit him and then he was left to die in the snow and there's all these issues about uh, someone even googled how long does it take to die in the snow and the state and the defense have been going back on this but again the thing to take home at the end of the day is that there is this complete division in massachusetts uh, for those who are watching this case and those in other states who are watching uh, for that matter as well that on the one hand it's a conspiracy on the other hand she did this um, in the court of law I tend to believe that the evidence will show uh, that Karen Reed uh, is likely guilty. And I, I think ultimately that is the decision we will see when this all plays out. 
not to uh, breathe more air into all of this controversy, but you you did mention that you had a guest on your show who kind of seems to be at the epicenter of a lot of the noise surrounding this whole case. Tell us a little bit about that, and was that you know. I can understand communities getting involved in a case that that involves, you know, public corruption and everything else, but this case really seems to have taken on a life of its own to the point that when Karen Reed enters the courtroom for just a regular evidentiary hearing, there's a standing ovation from half of the people in the in the audience. So this is definitely taken on a life beyond uh, what we usually see. Yeah, this is wild. I mean, if you're going to ever call a, a trial a circus, this is it. I mean, all the local news outlets in Boston are covering this uh, ferociously. You see the cameraman running down, chasing Karen Reed. But yeah, there's this guy, his name is Aiden Kearney, um, and he goes by Turtle Boy. He's a blogger, and this is what's going on, um, uh, with this shift from traditional media to bloggers. And um, look, he's a smart guy. And he's been on top of this case from the very beginning, but it's now been shown uh, that he was having conversations with Karen Reed. So you've got to wonder, you know, is, is there something bigger at play here? He showed up on my podcast and I say that because he was in the chat one day and I had a, a former scholar at Harvard Law and the two of them just went at it. It was one of the craziest <laughs> episodes I ever had. But this goes back to just the passion in Boston. These were two Bostonians. Uh, just going at it. Uh, but Turtle Boy really believes that there is this conspiracy, that there is this cover up. And um, there would have to be so many pieces that fit together. That's the issue I have. So many people in on this conspiracy for it to be true. That's where I believe it's a little far fetched. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with you. And then my bigger point is kind of how much of that actually ends up in front of a jury? Are we just doing a bunch of, like you said, circus that when we actually get to trial, the jury's not going to know anything about any of that. And it's really going to come down to DNA on a taillight and, 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 you know, text messages looking about how long it takes people to die in the snow. I mean, that, that really is going to be what the case comes down to, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's going to be really hard to see the jury here just because it is a zoo, a circus yeah. in Boston. And I can't imagine a lot of people not knowing at least some portion of this case. It's going to take a while for sure. We'll move on now to another uh, case that just seems to uh, continue to grab headlines. Out of Santa Fe, New Mexico, testimony continues this week in the trial of a film armorer charged with involuntary manslaughter. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, who pro prosecutors say was grossly negligent in her handling of firearms on Alec Baldwin's Rust film set, faced scrutiny from a veteran armorer and the film's assistant director. While both men alleged that Gutierrez-Reed had been deficient in some of her duties, experienced armorer Brian Carpenter, who did not work on the film, also testified that Gutierrez-Reed was inhibited by inexperience as well as time and budgetary constraints on set. In a video which could prove problematic for Baldwin, should he face trial, the actor is seen after a take allegedly hurrying Gutierrez Reed and the crew into reloading the weapon with seemingly little regard for precautions as he barks orders on the set. We have some of that footage that we're gonna to show to you now. One more, one more, one more. I forgot the recoil stuff. No, no, right away, right away, let's reload. Here we go. Let's go, Helena. Joel, I know we're early on in this case and there's there's a lot of trial still to be had, but it seems to me like with the development so far, it has not been the slam dunk that the prosecution might have expected. I mean, they're they're calling witnesses and they're not necessarily devastating to the prosecution, but the defense has also been able to use them a little bit to their advantage, especially now with these kind of release of these videotapes that we're seeing that we just uh, described. What are your thoughts on how it's advancing so far? Yeah, you know, I, th I think uh, what's so interesting right now is that this the defense has poked holes uh, in the state's case. You know, the state uh, maybe thought that they had this thing buttoned up, but they essentially came out and said, hey, look, uh, ha Hannah Gutierrez reed brought this live ammunition on the set and was totally irresponsible in the way she handled things. Uh, but the defense here said, look, you never uh, looked into the other guy, this guy, Seth Kenny, 
Uh, he was in charge of bringing in the dummy rounds. That was never investigated. So the defense has suddenly kind of put up um, exactly what they're supposed to do, uh, a strong defense where the state is now tripping over itself to some extent. And um, it's going to be, again, uh, as it always is, Josh, uh, to the juror's discretion at the end of the day, the video evidence with Alec Baldwin is obviously not going to help him. He's set to stand trial afterwards. But there are photos out there now uh, that, that were brought into evidence of Hannah Gutierrez Reed. And she at one point is even holding the gun up to her head um, in this kind of a manner. And that is clearly reckless. I mean, you're dealing uh, with firearms. And even though it is a movie set, the whole idea of having an armor on set is to protect everyone. And clearly that failed miserably in this case. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that prosecution has definitely shown that she wasn't doing her job properly, that she was not, um, you know, following safety protocols the way that she should have, that the set was kind of uh, cutting corners when it, when it came to that regard, especially in the handling of weapons. But what they haven't done and, and and this is where you see the chatter online and people saying, well, it doesn't matter if other people were unsafe. She was unsafe. The problem is this isn't a civil case. You have to show that she was not only unsafe, but it was so grossly negligent, so far beyond acceptable that she should be held criminally responsible. And that's where I think the defense is doing a good job because they're just kind of making it look like the whole thing was a mess. I mean, you pointed this out. And I wanted to get back to it. A big question here, and I think it's on the prosecution to answer this, is how did that live ammunition get onto the set anyways? And we haven't heard that answer to begin with. If they don't answer that, do you think this is something where she walks? Uh, I think there's a very uh, big possibility of that. And, and again, this is exact. the defense is tearing that beyond a reasonable doubt down uh, so the jurors have questions. It goes back to this guy. I think, uh, I think this is going to be very critical. This guy, Seth Kenny, the defense, uh, he's the guy that brought the, you know, the blanks uh, onto the set and was partially responsible. But the defense says, hey, investigators never looked into this guy. They never questioned him. And then when he finally was contacted, he was pointing the finger back at Gutierrez Reed saying, no, it's not me. It's them. And so the defense really pinned this down uh, during testimony. And I think that's what you're getting to where uh, jurors are going to scratch their heads and say, was this really all Hannah Gutierrez Reed's fault? Or maybe this guy, Seth Kenny, had something to do with it. And then you factor in the Alec Baldwin video. I think that can only help her because it goes to show, like you said, how chaotic the scene is. Movies are big, uh, you know, money projects. Alec Baldwin's got a, a reputation for having a temper. He wanted things moving uh, very swiftly and promptly. So was it just her or was it all these other uh, mitigating factors as well? Yeah. You know, it's funny you make a good point because even during that short clip of him kind of saying, let's run it back, let's run it back, you can see that part of his personality where he's not making a suggestion. He's given orders. And if that's kind of his personality and how others responded to him, I could easily see where, you know, if she's bringing up or someone else is bringing up, hey, we need to we need to recheck this, this gun and him saying, no, 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 we don't have time. Let's keep going. I'm not saying that happened. I'm just saying that part of his personality you could see kind of coming out in that video clip. Um, well, I'm, only one, I'm only laughing because I was a local reporter at Fox 5 in New York City and uh, I was telling you off air, um, he's got a temper. Uh, he called me a couple <laughs> of bad names that I can't say here, but uh, and I said a couple of things back to him, which I shouldn't have, but uh, he's got a temper. Is he an yeah. amazing actor? Yes. Was he rushing the process? Very likely. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Well, one thing that doing trials has taught me is that they go back and forth and one day you feel like you're winning and the next day you feel like you're losing. And so there's still much of this trial to be done. Nothing's over yet. We will continue to watch it. But in the meantime, that is our show. Joel, thank you so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you, your podcast, and especially your new book? Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, the podcast is Surviving the Survivor. Our main platform is YouTube, where we just past 100,000 subscribers. You can find us there, just plugging in Surviving the Survivor. We're also anywhere you listen to uh, audio podcasts, Spotify, Apple, and elsewhere. And then the book, 
Same title, so it's easy, Surviving the Survivor. <laughs> and uh, you can get it on Amazon right now as a pre-order. It will be available on Audible. And I just want to say, it is a very powerful story, not because I wrote it. It's my mother's story. Um, we had Carol Baskin from Tiger King on. She wrote a blurb for the book. She said that my mom, and it's true, Holocaust survivors are an endangered species now. There are very few left. And what's amazing is the Holocaust, uh, in her words, was not the worst thing she's gone through. It was the loss of her husband. Uh, and there's so many other poignant things here yeah. um, about life, marriage, children. And she has such wisdom. Uh, I, it's just very inspirational. So uh, if you get yeah. the chance, please give it a read. Let me know yeah. what you think. Thanks so much. I, I, I absolutely. It, it, like I said, it's one of those books where any book that can make it bring you to the brink of tears and at the, the on the next page make you laugh out loud is worth reading. So thank you again. I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at JoshuaRitter.com. You can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. Thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar.